Hi, everybody. I would like to also welcome you to today's presentation about our compensation analysis. As Tony mentioned, I'm Shana Anderson, one of the financialists with Key Management Group, and I look forward to covering this new service with you. Those of you who are not familiar with Key Management Group may benefit from understanding a little bit about our services as a whole before we dive specifically in today's services. And the best way that we can describe the services that we offer is by kind of walking you through the typical advisor path um, as they progress along their practice and showing you how our services fit in at these different points. So for solo advisors, a lot of them are focused on time management, marketing, acquisition, getting new clients, building their practice, and eventually once they get very busy, delegation, which is a new skill set that a lot of them haven't quite acquired yet. So some of our services that can help someone in this phase include executive coaching to help them think about their practice, what kind of clients they want to focus on, how to get referrals. Um, and then when they get very busy, we offer two outsourcing services, case preparation and financial planning, which can take those two time consuming items off of their plate so they can focus on client meetings. And also we introduce at this point guardian or continuity planning so that they can think seriously about their practice and what would happen if something should happen to them um, and they need a plan to continue their practice. Once an advisor gets to the point where they're hiring support staff, sometimes it's a paraplanner or an admin or uh, a combination thereof of office support, we get into our practice management service. Um, the skills that become important for an advisor in this phase are better organization, developing systems so they can get clients in on a regular basis, that they can make every meeting productive, uh, they can ask for referrals in a systemized way, and better communication between team members so that everyone is on the same page. And that's what our practice management service is all about, is making sure that everyone knows what their roles and responsibilities are, they're held accountable, the team is all working off the same sheet of music. We also offer HR services um, for a lot of advisors, this is the first time they're gonna be an employer, and there's a lot to know about employing people, how to incentivize them, making sure you have the appropriate things in your employee files, making sure you don't violate any laws, and our HR services help um, advisors focus on those things. We also have practice protection services um, that really ensure that the correct documentation is in place to protect, protect the practice. A lot of advisors will hire someone and not have the right documentation or contracts, and when things don't go right, they have no way to protect themselves, and that, that's what that service was developed to help with. We also offer acquisition consulting because at this point in the practice, a lot of advisors like to grow through acquisition, and we have people who can help them do that. Once we get to the point that you're in a team practice, which is defined as an advisor plus an AFA or another advisor or a group practice with multiple producers, we really need to focus on a totally new skill set. This is CEO thinking. We're building a brand at this point, and we're really focusing on protecting the equity in the long run. So it's not just a practice assigned to an advisor, but you're really building a business that needs management. And so the skill set is quite different. Um, this is where our AFA analysis will kick in. We'll talk more about that today. We also talk more about succession planning in a very serious way with team practices and introduce our advisor legacy service, which helps advisors sell their practice when they're ready to transition. Once an advisor is at that point where they're ready to retire or transition, we offer a deal-making service to make sure that they don't just sell their their practice to the person who they share an office with, but they are, really are thinking through finding the right type of successor, getting the most um, out of their practice, negotiating the deal, setting up the correct terms, and handling the transition. With that sometimes comes our escrow service, which will ensure that both advisors have an intermediate third party to help handle the payment of the practice, but that's further down the road. We also offer some specialized assessments, including business valuations, online assessment, an in-depth practice assessment, our practice protection assessment, and our human resources assessment, and all of those can be found on our website. For the purposes of today's call, we are going to be focused 
on advisors who are basically in this position. They're generally advisors who have some support, maybe they have a para planner, or they're at the point where they need a lot of support and they're wondering if they should make the jump into a team practice by hiring an AFA. And so with that, I'm gonna start with something we encounter quite a bit, and that is the myth that if you hire an AFA, your business will grow. A lot of advisors, when we talk to them, they say, I'm at the point now, I'm meeting with clients all day, I need someone else to join my practice as an AFA so I can grow. And while that can be true, the fact is if you hire an AFA, the only thing that's gonna go up for sure is your expenses and your risks. Making sure that your business will actually grow and your productivity will grow and your profitability will grow takes very careful planning. And it's not true that if you hire a new person, that's gonna happen automatically. I wanna share with you some information that we have from our valuation data. We took a look at practices with an AFA versus paraplanner. So in this first group, um, this is our single advisor who has support staff, but not another AFA and not another advisor. So in this case, it's one advisor plus two support staff, which could include a mix of paraplanners or unlicensed staff. And we compared it to practices that also had three people, but in this case, there's either two advisors, an advisor and an AFA, and one paraplanner. And we're gonna compare these two groups in terms of revenue, their average valuation of their practice. And then when we take that valuation, we're gonna look at it as a percentage of AUM and also as a multiplier of revenue. And here are the results. So as you can see, while we have a more limited, this is not every practice in the country, but the ones who came to us for valuations, and we do hundreds of valuations every year. So we do have a very robust data set to work from. You can see that it's not incredibly different between these two practices. And in fact, the practices that can get by with two paraplanners versus hiring an AFA sometimes fare better. So we're looking at similar um, revenue, GDC amounts, and similar valuations. Um, but it's actually a little bit tighter on the right where they have an AFA. And so again, that goes back to the point that hiring an AFA is not necessarily gonna make you more productive. It's just gonna increase your expenses. It can, but that's why we're having this meeting today because it's very important that we help advisors structure and strategize about how this AFA is going to help them. So as we dive into the question of hiring an AFA, generally we, we start off when we work with the advisors and we ask them, what kind of AFA are you hiring? Is this a brand new AFA? In which case, sometimes it's a college student who's graduating, who wants to get into the business. Um, this person may or may not be licensed. They may be currently working as a paraplanner, but they've never been a producer. And so we would consider all of those situations a new AFA. Um, is this an existing advisor or an AFA? Sometimes advisors pair up, there's two different advisors and one decides to become an AFA for another, or perhaps they're an AFA at a different practice and then they're gonna move over. We consider those to be bucketed separately from new AFAs. And then we have another category called experienced recruits. And these, these are also people who are currently advisors, but they're not at Ameriprise. They're generally at different firms or they have their own RIA or they're somewhere else. They have a book of business that qualifies for a special program to bring them over. So those are the three buckets we look at. We know there's nuances within each three, but generally um, the AFA situation at hand will fit one of those categories. Now, for the new AFA, the focus of our compensation analysis service is really to balance two different things. We know we need to create an attractive offer for the AFA. Um, an AFA generally needs something specific to come over to the practice. Sometimes they're looking for a salary or an opportunity to earn equity. It can be anything, but we have to be able to make an attractive offer for them to join. And on the other side, we have to balance that with improving the profitability of the practice. Okay, you can offer an AFA anything they want, but it might come at the detriment of the practice. And really our service is about balancing those two so that it's a win-win situation. 
For an existing AFA, when people hire us for the compensation analysis, the focus is generally different than that. They're already in a current situation. Perhaps um, the AFA is acting in a W-2 capacity with a, with a fixed salary, and they're considering moving to a payout grid. So really in those situations, we're comparing the current situation with the changes to the situation to see which one fares better for both the AFA and the practice. So when we think of the two different sides of the scale that we have to balance, and we look at what tools or what dials we have to play with on each side, um, the ones on the AFA side, when we're trying to create an attractive package for the AFA, often include a salary or a payout rate or a combination of the two, bonus opportunities, growth potential, earning into the practice via practice interest, or joining the practice so they can benefit from overhead support. And so depending on what's important to the AFA, these are all dials or tools that we can use to put the package together. On the other side of the equation, we need to figure out how is this AFA helping the practice and try to quantify that. By hiring the AFA, is the advisor able to grow faster? Are they able to focus more on top tier clients? Are they having access to new assets because this AFA is bringing over a book of business? Perhaps by joining forces, they're able to increase their payout rate or qualify for a financial planning bonus. Um, or also transition support staff. Maybe this person's currently in a paraplanner capacity where they don't produce and the advisor really wants them to be able to produce. And so all of these things are things that we think about and try to measure to make sure that the practice is also getting something out of the arrangement. Our methodology for the analysis when it's a new AFA is a four-step approach. Really, the first step is about getting a baseline scenario. What we want to look at is what would happen to their practice in five years if the advisor did not hire the AFA. We look at their GDC, their book of business, their financial plans, their predicted growth rate. We project out what would the practice look like in five years. Next thing we do is we consider all of the new expenses that the advisor will have to incur when hiring the AFA. This will include all of home office fees, including technology, supervision, ENO, things like that. Um, rent, acquisitions, if they're providing benefits as an employee, um, taxes they would pay, anything that has to do with expenses for the AFA, we calculate. And then we do step three, which is measuring the revenue sources. So how much is the AFA bringing in in new assets? How much are they growing the client base? How much is the freed up time for the advisor worth? And we really try to apply dollars to each of these things so we know how much money we have to work with when we get to step four, which is bringing the two things together, balancing out the AFA's needs versus what the practice can afford to pay the AFA. And so we answer questions such as, can this AFA's revenue offset their expenses? How much growth would be needed for this to be a profitable arrangement? And how long does it take to become profitable? It's not uncommon for them to start off in an unprofitable situation, but to turn quickly. So we want to know how long it's going to take to know if this is working or not. And what payout rates can the advisor offer to afford when setting up a pay grid for the AFA? So those are really the four steps that we follow when it, it is a new AFA. Now, when it's an existing AFA and we're running an analysis, it is just a little bit different than the last one. In this case, our baseline scenario is whatever they're currently doing now with the AFA. So we want to know how are they paying the AFA? Is the AFA W-2 or 1099? Are there any bonuses, et cetera? We set up the current situation as the baseline scenario. Step two is we project that baseline scenario for five years and look at what, what the relationship will look like in five years. Um, how much production, how much growth, et cetera. And in step three, we start setting up alternative scenarios. A lot of times when advisors come to us, what they're trying to weigh is right now, my AFA is a W-2, what would happen if we switched them to a, a 1099 or vice versa? Or what if we introduced a bonus or we took them off of salary and put them on a payout grid? Whatever the variables are, we set up the alternative scenario 
And then in the final step, we compare them to make sure both parties are getting what they need because sometimes their desires have changed over the years as they've worked together. Maybe at first equity wasn't important, but now it is. And so they wanna change their arrangement to incorporate equity. Whatever it is, we compare them in step four so they can see what the change would be if they altered their current arrangement. Now that we've talked through the process and about the service a little bit, it also helps if we show people pieces of the types of models we put together so they'll, they can get a better understanding of the kinds of things we go over in the meeting. Um, and I would also want to preface this with, while the model is great and the financial analysis really is helpful, I would say that it's the consulting piece that provides the most value to the advisors because a lot of times they're not sure if the AFA should have a salary or a payout grid or what percentage is appropriate given their situation. And so not only do we help model this for them so they know what they can afford, we can also help advise them based on different scenarios that we've seen and other ways that we've helped other advisors and what is typical for their situation so they can have that background as well. Um, this here is an example of a case where we had multiple payout grids based on different types of clients. This was grid one for practice clients, meaning clients that belong to the practice but then were assigned when the AFA joined. And this AFA received a $100,000 base salary, but at the point that they achieved $300,000 of GDC, they jumped over to a payout grid. So you can see there when we model it, if they produced less than 300,000, they received their $100,000 guaranteed salary. But if they were producing more, that salary was no longer applicable and they would be paid on a payout grid that increased over time as they became more productive. Now this is just one of hundreds of different scenarios. It can be, any of these can be tweaked. For example, some people want the increments to go up every $250,000 or every $50,000. Some don't have a salary. Some have a higher or lower payout grid based on the AFA's experience. And so we see all kinds of things. Please don't anchor to the numbers that I'm showing you here. But I did wanna show you an example of how we help set up a payout grid. Another thing that we help advisors structure is the financial planning bonuses. Some advisors don't need one, but some really want one because they themselves might, a difference of 1% versus 4% in their own paycheck makes a big difference. And so if they're gonna be hiring an AFA, they really want that AFA to increase their planning numbers, and we can incentivize that behavior by offering bonuses. And there's all different types of uh, financial planning bonuses, but I'd say the most standard ones are a grid similar to the advisor grid, but generally um, with different thresholds and percentages, a flat fee financial planning bonus. Some advisors want to say, you know, for every plan you sell, you get X dollars. And sometimes uh, advisors pay bonuses based upon the actual financial planning fees. And so those are the three most common. Sometimes there's hybrids, sometimes there's conditions. You only get this if we sell 200 plans this year, whatever the case may be. So this is just one sample of how we help structure financial planning bonuses. The other thing we do is we help them with their expense planning. A lot of advisors know that they're gonna have expenses and they know there's home office expenses and supervision fees and things like that, but they've never really taken the time to write out what all of these expenses would look like in one year. And this is something we help walk them through. Um, we get very accurate numbers. Um, we don't estimate, we actually pull in exactly what their AFA fees will be and um, what their supervision fees and E&O and technology. And then uh, things like rent will help them decide, is this already a sunk cost? Are they already in an office that's empty that you're paying for? Or are you incurring a new expense um, when you have to rent an office for them? Is that something that you're gonna pay or the AFA is gonna pay? We walk them through each detail for each expense so they can fully see the picture of what they're incurring when they hire this new AFA. The other piece that we help them with is thinking through equity and how to share equity. And technically, they cannot give equity to their AFA. And so that's where my partner, Kathy Sweet, um, who focuses on franchise rules and 
you know, labor laws, things like that. She takes a different approach to it. Um, I will talk to them about the financial aspects of equity or what is more typically called practice interest arrangements. And she will help, uh, help them understand what kind of documentation they need in place, what they're allowed to do, what they're not allowed to do. She'll walk them through those aspects of it. From the financial perspective though, a lot of times what we see is they want to offer practice interest based on growth or based on client type or some combination thereof or a vesting schedule where maybe they don't earn anything into the practice until after two years or five years or 20 percent each year for five years we've seen all different kinds of combinations and this is something we help them think through and model so that when they put an offer on the table for the AFA, if the AFA is more incentivized by equity than cash flow or you know, salaries or payouts, we can help them balance these two things. The other thing that the advisor will see is we do projections on how much pro productivity we expect this AFA to do. And we really look at if it would help the advisor's payout rate. If an advisor is making, maybe they're at the 84% payout rate, but bringing in this AFA bumps them up to the 91% payout rate, that's a very big difference. And we need to know what that number is, what it equates to, because that will factor into what they have that they can afford the AFA with. And so they're gonna see a year by year projection for the next five years as to how that AFA's productivity is changing their own payout rate and what that means to their bottom line. I believe the most powerful part of the whole packet that we give to them is the profitability analysis because you really need to look at it in, a, in the long term. Um, what we do is we take all of the things we've talked about up to this point, uh, how much productivity the AFA is bringing in, what are you giving up if you assign your clients or some of your clients to the AFA? You used to you know, get paid 90% on those, but now you're assigning them to the AFA and it's part of the AFA's productivity. What change does that make for your bottom line? What expenses are you incurring? If you're giving them a bonus, that's also an expense we have to think about. And we put it all together and we look at the profitability of this arrangement. And I'll tell you, it's very rare that we see a positive profitability in year one. There's just a lot of expenses and most AFAs don't come in hitting the ground running. It's gonna take them some time. And so it's not uncommon when you put it on paper for it to look like a very negative scenario. Um, but we project this forward and we help the advisor figure out how long can you give this arrangement in the negative before you need to see some profitability. Can we expect profitability in year two? If so, what metrics do you have to hit for, for you to know that you're making money on this? Things like that. And so this is a sample printout of some of the analysis we do around net profitability of the arrangement. And in this case, you can see in year one, it's quite negative, but already in year two, they're in the positive, year three and so on, it continues to grow. And so this really, I believe helps advisors make decisions. And a lot of times we look at this and then we have to go back and change the payout rates that we were going to offer or the salary or um, whatever decisions we had made about expenses to make this a more positive arrangement for the AFA, for the advisor. So the other piece that we talked about is helping them model the practice, um, interest or the practice equity and we help assign hypothetical dollar values to that equity at different points in time and again this becomes an important piece for for afas coming in where maybe they wanted to make a little bit more money but they're not and this really helps them see it as an opportunity an opportunity to earn an asset earn into a practice that has value and a lot of times this can help the negotiations between the advisor and the afa so to get started on this process, when 
an advisor hires us to help them with their AFA analysis, we try to make it very easy for them. We send them a questionnaire that will ask them a lot of questions just about who is this AFA, what are you hoping to get out of this arrangement, what experiences do you have, do they have, um, things like that to help us understand what's going on between the advisor and the AFA. We asked for a couple of reports. The most important one for us is the Franchise Advisor Payout Grid Report. So um, as I showed earlier, we really want to model any changes in the payout rate that might occur if they hire the AFA. So we ask for that report. And we might also email them a list of questions based on their specific situation um, so that we can build the best model possible for them. The final output that they receive after they meet with us and work with us to establish all these numbers I've talked about is they're going to get two different reports. The first one is an advisor facing report. It's about 15 to 30 pages long, depending on what we modeled. Um, this is really going to focus on the advisor's point of view and then net profitability they can expect from working with the AFA over time. We know that this report is not necessarily what you want to put in front of the AFA, and so we developed a second report, which is an AFA facing, which focuses on things like the salary, the payout rates, um, any financial planning bonuses. It's really going to detail the offer being put forward from the AFA's perspective and what the AFA is getting out of the arrangement. Most of the presentation has been about compensation design and what I do as a financial analyst with Key Management Group. I'm in the middle there. But it's really our larger team who helps the advisor through this process. And what I do is really one small part of the bigger picture. Kathy Sweet, who is above me um, on this slide here, she is a practice protection expert. And so while my focus is mainly on what can the advisor afford, what is a fair arrangement, how much do things cost, there's also a whole other aspect of franchise rules, labor laws, what you're allowed to do when you compensate an AFA, what you're not allowed to do, different classification guidelines for W-2 versus 1099, and most importantly, what documentation is needed for this to be a valid arrangement so that if it doesn't work out two or three years down the road, how you split back the clients and make it very clear who owns the clients and how to back out of an arrangement. Kathy will cover all of that with the advisor, and that also helps us do the financial modeling because while on, on paper the numbers might lend better to a 1099, the law might prevent uh, the advisor in a particular situation from hiring them as a 1099. Maybe they have to go W-2. And so Kathy really helps them think through those aspects of hiring an AFA. Um, on the bottom left hand of the slide is Todd Doherty. Now Todd is an expert at succession planning. He does our business valuations, continuity planning, and uh, helping people think through the long term if they're going to transition their practice to an AFA. The business valuation is very important in this process, especially in situations where practice interests might be shared between the advisor and the AFA. A lot of people like to use rule of thumb, you know, the practice is worth X times GDC, and that is just not accurate. That's not our experience. And so we always recommend to advisors that they have a business valuation officially completed on their book of business before they introduce an AFA into their practice. Now, a lot of the advisors who we work with are already working with a coach. And if they're not, we often recommend them to one of our executive coaches or our practice management coaches, depending on their situation. The role of an executive coach or a practice management coach is much more long term than what we offer with the AFA analysis. A coach can help them actually implement the AFA arrangement. They can help with communication, transitioning clients over, how to develop roles and responsibilities and hold people accountable, how to set appropriate goals, all of those things. And so if someone is not currently working with a coach, we often recommend that they work with a coach. And we have coaches all over the country who have worked with practices in all different stages. Um, and so based on the situation, we would likely recommend them to one of our coaches. 
So if this is a service that the advisor is interested in, they can purchase it online. If you go to our website, um, I have the URL at the end, keymanagementgrp.com. It's under our services, you'll see our AFA analysis, and right on there is a button where you can click and purchase online. So the advisor can pay with credit card right there online, and it will trigger a series of steps after that so that we collect the questionnaire and book the appointment and every, everything goes from there, um, but it's done online. And right now the price is $9.95, and I say currently because what we're finding is that a lot of advisors are requiring multiple meetings beyond the ones that we have scoped out. And so um, we are reevaluating that price. If you know anyone on the fence of purchasing this, I would suggest they do it sooner than later because chances are that price is gonna have to go up a little bit just based on how many meetings we're doing with the advisors. This is the URL, https keymanagementgrp.com. And again, if you go under the services, you will see our AFA analysis. So I thank you for listening and we will open it up to any questions.